we are told that it's very possible we are on the downside, dropping off the top of the curve, the peak that we've been trying to flatten with our separation from one another, and we hope it is. We, we pray that that will be the case and that those who have to make those sorts of decisions will be very wise. I've been reading more and more different people writing columns and newspapers and things of that nature, talking about what will life be like after this separation, after this quarantine, so to speak. Uh, they say there's going to be a new normal, but it won't be the old normal. Things are going to change, and no doubt that will be the case, especially until we have a vaccine for this uh, disease. But this morning, I want to talk to you about something else that happened. It didn't happen over a matter of weeks. It was a matter of a weekend. And in that one event that we sort of run together, we call the Passion Week, and we especially include the Friday of crucifixion and the Sunday of an empty tomb, we uh, are forever changed. We should be forever changed. We should be, more than anything else, as people who claim to trust in Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord, Easter people. Easter people. We're going to be looking in 1 Peter this morning. And I want to share with you just a very basic, a four-point outline, if you will, of both beliefs and behaviors that set us a, a benchmark for, for the way we ought to live, the way that we ought to live in the light of the fact that Jesus Christ is alive from the dead, never again to die, and we who belong to Him share in that. This morning I'm calling it uh, the four R's of Easter, the four R's of Easter, because uh, this is where it all starts, this is what it stands upon, and the four R is just a way to write it down and help you to think about it this morning. We're going to be looking here in 1 Peter chapter 3 and in the first part of chapter 4. Let's begin by reading the last few verses of chapter 3, beginning in the 18th verse. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. After being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to Him. The first R that I want to share with you this morning, the, the first R of Easter is reality. Reality. I, I can't think of a more appropriate word to say to you. Do you trust in Jesus? Then you need to embrace the reality of the cross and the empty tomb. Everything changed that day. Everything. And there is nothing that is the same. And there is nothing that this world can tell us that denies, that overrides, or diminishes this truth. The Apostle Peter stood absolutely convinced of the sacrificial death and the glorious resurrection of Jesus Christ for our salvation. He is certain that these things happened. He is confident of what they meant. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. Peter didn't have to go very far to understand this. His own behavior the night that Jesus was arrested drove him to understand his need for his Savior. He had pledged to Jesus earlier that night. He would never deny him. 
never abandon him. He swore to the Lord, I'll die for you. It was only a few brief hours later when Jesus had been seized out in the Garden of Gethsemane. He'd been drugged into the courtyard of the house of, uh, of the uh, high priest and, and, and taken in to be challenged. And, and Peter waited out there. It, it, it wasn't an army. It wasn't a sword at his throat. It was a servant girl who said, you've been with him. You belong to Jesus, don't you? And he crumbled like a sheet of tissue paper. No, I don't know him, he said. That was only the beginning of that awful night. Perhaps he watched on from a distance as the one he had followed, the one he had confessed was the son of the living God. He was crucified. Jesus was placed in a borrowed tomb while Peter perhaps hid behind a locked door. And as he was there those next couple of days with the other disciples, he probably wished he was hundreds of miles away. Like we do in times of failure and tragedy, Peter must have rehearsed the events that night of the garden uh, uh, again and again. What could I have done different? Should I have spoken up? Should I have pulled out my sword earlier. What could I have done? And then early that Sunday morning, his fitful sleep was interrupted with the knocking and the voices of women saying, come quick, come quick, Jesus is gone. We don't know where they've taken him. Peter and John jumped up. They ran to the grave. They saw the grave clothes folded there. And before the day was done, they saw Jesus, alive again. Peter would never be the same, but he knew where he had come from. There was a new reality that changed his life from top to bottom. Because he was, as he describes himself a little later here in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1, a witness of Christ's sufferings, one who is also going to share in the glory that is to come when Jesus returns, he testifies to you and to me, we can believe Him. We can believe what He has seen, what He has experienced. We can have an absolute confidence Jesus did die for sins. He rose again from the dead and He's gone into heaven and He's at the Father's right hand even now. This is the basic reality of the Christian life. Whether otherwise times are good or times are bad. Whether we are healthy or whether we are ill. Whether we are uh, prosperous or barely hanging on. This is our fundamental reality. That first Easter changed everything for Peter and it should change everything for you and for me. Embrace the reality of Easter. That's the first R of Easter. And it hints at the second R of Easter. And that's to respond. You need to respond to the invitation that Peter is extending here. If you haven't already. Peter has some peculiar things to say in this passage about Noah way back in the early pages of the book of Genesis and his family. He says they were saved through water in the ark. And what it boils down to is that God invited them in and they responded in faith to his invitation. They went into the boat, God shut the door, the waters came, and they were born through the waters. It's a familiar story. But Peter makes this application. He says that those waters they pass through are symbolic of the waters of baptism that now saves you also. Now we Baptists don't hold to a belief in any mystical power of baptismal water to do anything for anybody. 
I can't just sneak up behind someone and pour it over them and somehow they're saved. No. The power lies in an act of obedience to the God who asks us to believe and be baptized. As Peter puts it here in verse 21, it is the pledge or the response of a good conscience toward God. When someone comes to believe in the reality of the death and resurrection of Jesus for their salvation, the next step, according to Scripture, is to publicly profess that faith, to boldly present themselves to be baptized. That is the biblically mandated response of an individual to the reality of what Jesus has done. We're to do this however, wherever we can. Last night, Lisa and I sat and we watched the uh, worship service of my cousin Trey Fleming and his family. They're serving as missionaries in Osaka, Japan. And they, they, they had a little worship service there. And then at the end of it, they went out on a balcony and they had a pool filled up with water on the balcony. And, and there he baptized his youngest daughter. I know that was a thrill for him. But perhaps even a greater thrill. I don't know if this is the very first one, but he baptized a convert from his work over there too. In a blown up wading pool. They were so cold they were shouting as they got into the water. But they were obedient. They were obedient in baptism. Maybe you need to commit your life to Jesus. You need to present yourself to Him for baptism. Well, Peter isn't done with what he has to say. There is a third R of Easter. It is revolution. Peter calls us to join the Easter revolution. Let's read about it in the fourth chapter beginning in verse 1. Therefore, since Christ suffered in His body... Arm yourselves also with the same attitude, because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. As a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. The revolution these verses speak of is an internal revolution. It's something that changes on the inside. It's the transformation of your attitudes, your behaviors, by the power of God and with His help by His Spirit, the cooperation of our will to say, God, I want to be different. And it all is empowered by Jesus' resurrection. You see, the horrible reality of Jesus being nailed to the cross, we've already talked about it, but let me remind you again, our sins put Him there. The righteous for the unrighteous. That's you, that's me. That's how terrible our rebellion is before a holy God that nothing but a death could atone for it. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. The events of Good Friday bring that home to us. When Jesus was on the cross and our sins were put upon Him, the Bible tells us that the sky in the middle of the day grew black like night. And that wasn't some Hollywood special effect. That was a spiritual reality of our sin being placed upon Him. He who had lived in unbroken fellowship with His Father was suddenly cut off, with him, uh, cut off from Him. And He cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God hadn't forsaken Him. He couldn't look upon our sin. And it separated Him. The revolution that should occur in every Christian's life is described here in verse 2. It says, They do not live the rest of their earthly life for evil human desires, 
but rather for the will of God. When you stop and think about it, how could it be any other way? To remain in sin, to keep on living just like the world and laughing and turning aside from the things God asks us to do, it's to curse at, it's to spit upon the cross. We see some of the practices that should be put out of our lives. Debauchery, lust, drunkenness. Orgies, carousing, detestable idolatry. Do you belong to Jesus? Cut it out, he says. We can add to that list from other biblical passages things like hatred, unforgiveness, lying, greed, among others. But we mustn't think that this revolution is merely negative. Its greater part is to learn to live in the love and the joy of the Lord. I I didn't put this in the PowerPoint, but I, I read this this week and I thought it was so good. It says, we make a mistake if we think that God wants to turn us from sinners into holy people. It says, God wants to turn us from sinners into lovers. Lovers of God. It's a revolution. It's a love revolution. His life, His love poured out in our lives. We mustn't think that this revolution then is just negative. It's to turn in and to live that God is honored, that is glorified. It's going to be a fits and start sort of thing. We're going to stumble and repent and begin again. That's all right. Join the revolution. And then last, the fourth and final hour of Easter takes us into this realm of living for the will of God just a little bit further. The reality of Jesus' death and resurrection should result, we've said, in a result of faith and baptism. It should bring about a personal revolution in your behavior. And last, it should give you a new resolve to live as Jesus lived. We're going back to chapter 4. I'm picking up the reading in verse 7. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Make a resolution. Make a resolution. Notice, first of all, the reason why. For this resolution, the end of all things is near. We're on heaven time now. We're on the time of waiting for Jesus' return. He's won the victory on the cross. He's seated at the Father's right hand, and he's waiting for one word from the Father to say, Go, go get my children. We're living in that time. We don't know when Jesus will return for the church. For his people, but the Bible tells us he's coming. Even if he doesn't return soon, the reality, and that's something that's being brought home to us right now with the concern about this this, uh, uh, coronavirus is that our individual end is never too far off. The Bible speaks of wars and rumors of wars, earthquakes, famines, Seas roaring, and one that, frankly, I hadn't thought about in a long time, but I've been forced to lately, pestilence, disease. Things that are signs that remind us the time is short. We will each have to answer for what we've done with the life God has given us, and beyond the basic fact, the need for faith in Jesus as our Savior, we should resolve, Peter says, to be alert 
and of sober mind. Not manipulated by the culture around us. With God's help, we need to turn our focus. We need to pray. And Paul adds in 1 Thessalonians 5, pray without ceasing. We need to love one another deeply. Offer hospitality to one another, even if it has to be at a social distance right now. We're to use whatever gift we have received to serve others. In all this, we have a new purpose. Here is the purpose, people, for how we ought to live in the light of Jesus and what He's done for us in Easter. So that in all things, God may be praised through Christ Jesus. Are you an Easter person? Have you embraced the reality of what Jesus has accomplished for you on the cross and in rising from the dead? Have you responded to Him in personal faith and followed Him in believer's baptism? Perhaps you're at that point today that you're realizing, I need to take that next step. I need to quit sitting on the fence. I need to choose before it's too late. You see, the one part of the image of, of, of Noah and the family in the boat is Genesis tells us that once they went in and the door was closed, there were others that couldn't go in. God had closed the door. Don't wait too long. Are you practicing a revolution in your behavior? Do people see that you belong to the love revolution in Jesus? And are you resolved to serve Him no matter what? We're called to be Easter people. Jesus has the victory. The tomb is empty. Do you have that confidence that you are His? 